cloud formations is one of those subject matters that is passed off as randomness and explained away in that context. But we as humans have a deep fascination with clouds, almost like it's our subconscious telling us something. We see what shapes we can see in those formations and our imagination will allow the creation of anything we think of with a close outline. But where does that come from? Is it possible that we do this today because in the past the clouds were behaving in ways that we could not explain? Secure Team had a recent clip sent that looks like things emerging out of nowhere, almost like the clouds were acting like a cloaking device. There is a Bible reference that suggests before the return of God that there would be signs in the sky, and it got us thinking about the story of St. Andrew. As you know, Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland, and it was from one of Andrew's visions as to where the flag of Scotland came into existence. Wait, do you hear this? You are probably wondering where we are going with this, right? Well, the flag of Scotland comes from an encounter that the saint seen as a sign from God. He looked up in the sky and prayed to God, and what he saw when he opened his eyes was a white X pattern set on a clear blue sky. And he saw that as a sign from God, and of course it became his banner, and eventually the flag of Scotland. St. Andrew was later crucified on a cross of the same shape because it was synonymous with this life-altering interpretation. Clouds don't generally form that way. Something would have had to have been pluming smoke contrails or something similar to create that scarring in the sky. And then the cross passed with another UFO to create the X. Could St. Andrew's vision actually be ancient activity in the skies above Scotland? How else do you explain what he saw? We do know this is crazy guys, but maybe it's crazy enough to be true. Another very interesting thing about Scotland is how it got its name. Would it surprise you to learn, for example, that an Egyptian princess lends her name to the ancient land? The founding ancestor of the Scottish people was a woman named Scotta, daughter of an Egyptian pharaoh and wife of a Greek prince. Before there were written records, oral tradition was the primary means of handing down history. The story of Scotta was brought to us through oral history. And nowadays, there are scientific methods that can actually prove that there is some truth in the legend. There were some enterprising Scottish historians in the 14th and 15th centuries CE who recorded their versions of the history of the early Scots. John Forden, a prominent Scottish chronicler and member of the secular clergy, wrote the Chronicles of the Scottish People. The following century, Walter Bower wrote his chronicle, Scotta Chronicon, which expanded the scope of Forden's work. One version of the legend of Scotta comes from these works, based on oral tradition and earlier sources that probably no longer exist. The tale begins with a Greek prince named Gaethilus. As happens quite often in history, the royal prince was not given any position of power by his father. Gaethilus, being angry about this, caused much destruction and trouble in his father's kingdom, even going so far as gathering his own army. His father forced him into exile. He sailed across the Mediterranean to Egypt where the pharaoh Akhenaten was in a struggle to drive the Ethiopians out of his lands. The Ethiopians had a powerful kingdom to the south and at various times had ruled parts of Egypt. Gaethilus joined his army with that of the pharaoh during the fight, and together they pushed the Ethiopians out of Egypt. At the end of these hostilities, Gaethilus formed another alliance with Akhenaten to help keep the children of Israel in bondage. In recognition of his loyalty, bravery, and strength, Akhenaten gave his daughter Skada in marriage. The Scotta Chronicon goes on to tell us that Akhenaten was the pharaoh who died when the Red Sea parted as he was chasing the children of Israel. The people of Egypt were looking for reform and saw the death of the pharaoh as their opportunity to make changes. Gaethilus was viewed as a continuation of the status quo, and after a period of civil unrest, he was again driven into exile. The army and people that went into exile with Gaethilus proclaimed him their king and called themselves Scots after their queen. However, there was no kingdom to rule. They wandered the desert for years before he took his family and his tribe of Scots and sailed from the African continent to the Iberian Peninsula, 
present-day Spain and Portugal. There they settled in the northwest corner of the peninsula at a place called Brigancia. It is now the city of A Corona, located in the province of Galicia, Spain. Scotta gave birth to a son named Hybert. It is said the old name for Ireland, Hybrinia, comes from this son. The descendants of the Scots tribe lived on the Iberian Peninsula for several generations in a state of perpetual war with the local Iberian tribes. Eventually, some members of the tribe sailed across the Cantabrian Sea, the Bay of Biscay, in search of a new place to live, and settled in Ireland. Some of these settlers established a home in Scotland in the area that comprises contemporary Argyle. After the time of the Romans, the people in this area were called the Scotti and ultimately the name of the country to the north of Britain became Scotland, named long after the life of an Egyptian princess. The language that was brought to this region, called Gaelic, is also thought to have originated with these peoples and developed from Egyptian to Gaelic as they sought out a permanent home. There is one other angle to the story of Scotta to consider regarding the Scottish people, and that is the story of the Stone of Destiny. The stone has been used in the crowning of Scottish kings throughout history. The existence and origins of the stone are shrouded in mystery, legend, and mythology that have biblical roots. Another name for the stone is Jacob's Pillow. Supposedly, it was used as a pillow by Jacob when he had a dream of angels. The stone somehow came into the possession of Gaithalus, and when he was exiled from Egypt, he took the stone on his long journey to Iberia. Ultimately, the descendants of Gaithalus and Scotta took the stone to Ireland, where it was established as a seat or throne in Terra. The stone was brought to Scotland from Ireland by King Fergus in 498, and he was crowned on the stone. There is a story of how the Irish monk and missionary St. Columba brought the stone to the Isle of Iona in the 6th century. In 1286, Alexander III of Scotland died, leaving an infant granddaughter as his successor. She was known as Margaret, the Maid of Norway, and it was agreed by the Scottish nobles that she would be their queen. However, on her voyage from Norway to Scotland, she unfortunately died at the age of seven. There were 13 claimants to the throne, and the Scottish asked Edward I of England to act as mediator. A Scots noble, John Balliol, was chosen and crowned as Schoon, but many Scots resented Edward's interference in their government, and Balliol began an alliance with the French in 1296 and fought against the English. As the victor, Edward first annexed Scotland to England and placed the Scots under military occupation. He also seized the honors of Scotland, along with the Stone of Destiny, and brought it to Westminster Abbey. He built a chair known as St. Edward's Chair, or the Coronation Chair, with a slot underneath to hold the stone. Thus, when the kings of England were crowned on the chair, it signified that they ruled Scotland as well. On Christmas Day 1950, a group of students who studied at Glasgow Uni traveled down to London. What took place that day lives on in infamy as the students managed to seize the Stone of Destiny from Westminster Abbey and return it back home to Scotland, a memory that lives on in the boldness of the Scottish people. However, in 1952, the police were tipped off that the stone was at the site of the high altar at Arbroath Abbey, where in 1320, the assertion of Scottish nationhood was made in the Declaration of Arbroath. The stone was returned to Westminster Abbey in February 1952. The legend connecting Scotta to the Stone of Destiny did not appear in written records until the early 14th century in order to increase the significance of the Scottish people's history. In 1996, an agreement was made to return the stone to Scotland, and in November of that year, there was a ceremony at the border of Scotland and England transferring the stone, and now resides in Edinburgh Castle with the rest of the honors of Scotland. We will leave it at that for now, guys. We hope you enjoyed this brief piece of lost Scottish history. It's amazing how we went from Secure Team's analysis of cloud formations and ended up talking about the Egyptian princess who became the first and original queen of Scotland. We will speak with you in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching.